You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Yodi Anderson. So today we're going to be talking about choosing a friend for life. And of course, I'm talking about dogs. I've had lots of friends lately who have been looking for puppies or helping other people look for puppies. And I did promise that I would do a show on how to choose the right dog for you. There's so much information I want to pack into this that this is actually going to be a three-parter. Today, we're going to be talking about how to decide if you need a dog or what kind of dog to get in the first place. More on that when we come back to get positive results on Pet Life Radio. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Yodi Anderson. You can't choose your family, but you can certainly choose your dog. That is family. So today we're going to be talking about choosing a friend for life. I mentioned that I had a lot of friends lately just looking for puppies. Sometimes it's just worked out for them that it was time for them that they wanted another puppy. Some of my friends who are also trainers are helping other people choose puppies, which is a great thing to do, by the way, is ask a trainer to help you. And I do remember that several shows ago, I said that I would do a show on how to choose the right dog for you. As a professional trainer, a lot of what I see is a bad match. (laughs) People just pick the wrong dog for them. And it's not their fault a lot of times. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not their fault. They just made a choice that wasn't well-researched or they were given misinformation and they didn't make a good match. And just as with matching with people, it can be a challenge. Matching you to the right dog can be a challenge too. Maybe your heart is already set on a specific dog and that's great. But What I want to make sure is that you do your research, that you truly know what you're bringing home. There's so much information. I'm going to split this into several shows. Today, we're going to be talking about doing the research, how to figure out if you're ready for a dog, and what kind of dog might best fit you. That's what we're going to be talking about today. You know, the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show just wrapped its 139th event. That is a long time. It is the second longest continuously held sporting event in the United States. Did you know that? It is next only to the Kentucky Derby, and that's only by one year. The Kentucky Derby was going on one year longer than the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Uh, By the way, congratulations to Miss P, the 15-inch beagle who won it this year. Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show is also one of the highest rated shows on television. It gets tons of ratings. That's why they put it on TV every year. It gets great ratings for the network every year. And every time it comes on, this time every year, friends start posting about it. I see social media blowing up about it, Twitter, Facebook especially. I'm much more on Facebook. I don't do any tweeting But people post with comments about the show. They talk about, oh, look at the such and such, and isn't it adorable? And I think I want one of those. And dog trainers post, veteran, everybody posts about Westminster. And the average pet owner posts about Westminster because it's a great show, and they love to see all the dogs. Many of them also post, I've noticed over the years, that they get ideas for dogs that they want by watching. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's great fun. Um, I've been to Westminster several times. Um, It was a great privilege to go. For a dog person, going to Westminster is like going to the Super Bowl. I'll never forget standing on the green carpet at Madison Square Garden and just 
thrilled to bits to be there. As with any sporting event, there are good aspects to it and bad aspects. With anyone, you're going to get that. But for the most part, Westminster is a great thrill. And I know that the folks that compete at Westminster are thrilled to be there. It's quite the honor, and especially for those who win. But even getting there is quite the feat. It is very exciting to go. So if this is a barometer of people getting ideas for dogs, I don't think it's a bad one because you at least get to see them. But you have to remember they're going to dig, they bark, they chew, they jump up on people. And you need to take all that into consideration before bringing one home. So where do you start? I mean, it's really easy to fall for a dog because of its looks. And that's what that is. That's conformation, not confirmation, conformation event in which the dogs are judged on their structure and their, their beauty and how they conform to the breed standard. Every breed club has a standard And that's what they are judged on. They're not judged on how smart they are or whether they're sweet or whether they can go save Timmy from the well. They're judged on how they conform to that breed standard. That's not a bad thing. The structures are put in place by the breed clubs for a reason. But remember, it's much more important to choose a dog for the whole package that you bring home, not just how they look. I've had several couples over the years come through class and they're generally very similar these couples they have manicured nails and they have the latest haircuts and the lay they wear the latest fashions and you can tell that they live in a beautiful home that is immaculately perfect it's clean and it has the latest furniture and it has all these beautiful knickknacks that just collect dust in my house but you can tell that these people are fairly well-to-do or trying to be well-to-do, and they are just a beautiful, beautiful couple. And in this situation, the ones that they have in common, they've also gotten Weimar honors. Weimar honors are gorgeous dogs. They're the silver dogs. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful dogs. And every single one of these couples has been at their wit's end with their Weimar honors. Weimar honors are a sporting breed. They're really active. They need lots of exercise and lots of mental stimulation, or they can be really, really destructive. And when I talked to the couples about why they chose this dog, it was for their looks. These dogs were beautiful, and they went perfect in the beautiful home. What they didn't take into account was the personality of this dog, and it ended up being a bad match. Bad match for the Weimar honor, bad match for these perfect couples. These people also happen to work you know, 80 hours a week, and they didn't have time for this dog, so the dogs were quite destructive. And it's happened a couple times, not, not every time, but it's happened a couple times, and I can tell usually when somebody picked a dog just because it's gorgeous, and it's not going to end well. It's not going to necessarily end well, so my goal today is to help you avoid that. You would never be so shallow as to just pick a dog for its looks, but come on. You want Watch Westminster, and some of them are just so cute, aren't they? They really are. So it's time to ask yourself some questions. Now, I know planning isn't sexy. I know this. I am a planner. So to me, planning makes me happy. I am the type of person who wants to plan my trip, and I want to know what hotel I'm going to stay at, and I want to know this, that, and the other thing. It just, I like to plan. I'm fairly good at it. And the kind of life I live, as many things as I do, I need to plan because if I don't, I'm going to end up regretting it. So for some people, planning is a bore. They don't like to deal with it. They love impulse purchases. I've known people to come home and announce that they bought a car. To me, I look at them with a mix of envy and horror as I realize, how could you do that? Did you check out the gas mileage? Did you find out what the safety ratings are on these vehicles? I know, I know, I'm a boring dog trainer, planner person. But with a dog, buying a car is an expense. It's a, a very big expense, and you have maintenance costs with that car. With a dog you bring home, it can be expensive. There are maintenance costs with that. And it's a living, breathing, emotional creature. And when it doesn't work out, it is bad for both parties. So we're not going to do any impulse purchasing. So I promise I'll try to make this as exciting as I can for you about planning. And hopefully I'll introduce you to some questions you might have neglected to ask yourself that actually might be pretty big deals. So let's go into this open-minded and let's start planning for our pet. And I promise you, if you do the planning ahead of time, the happy ending is much more likely to happen. Another thing to remember, too, is that if it doesn't work out because you didn't do your research and you didn't plan, your heart's going to be broken. You're going to feel bad about the dog. If you have children in your life, they are going to be heartbroken. I've known that to happen too, where dad comes home with an impulse purchase puppy. Mom hates the dog, did not plan this at all. They weren't prepared. The dog gets bigger. The family's not going to be able to keep the dog. And then 
the children are already in love with the dog and the dog has to go and it just makes for a bad situation. It's also not fair to the dog. It really isn't fair to the dog. This dog is trying to bond with you and live with you and learn your rules and then it gets completely upended when it ends up in another home or in a shelter or other situation. So this is why we do our planning. It's not exciting, I know, but it's important. So we're going to hit that first. We're going to start with some very practical questions. One, do you have time for a dog? They require a lot of time. They require time to take them to the vet, time to train, time to teach them the rules of your house, time to love, time to snuggle, time to groom, time to give them exercise. They require a lot of time. And you need to be realistic. You know, how much do you work a week? How much are you out of the home a week that your dog can't go with you? If your dog can go with you, that's great. But how much time do you have to devote to a dog? Dogs for hundreds and hundreds of years, are bred to be with people. While there are some breeds that are more aloof towards people than others, most dogs really want to be with you. And if they can't, they're going to develop destructive behaviors or fear and aggression behaviors if they're not adequately socialized. And they're just not going to be happy. So it's not fair to bring home a dog that really loves people and wants to be bonded with you and you're never home. Now, when you take a look at your hours away and how many hours you have to dedicate to your pet, if they're starting to add up, it doesn't necessarily mean that a dog isn't right for you right off the bat. For example, if you have what you consider to be enough time, you're going to have time every day for the dog and you can exercise the dog and do these things, but maybe you work every day during the day and you're not able to come home. Well, if you don't have a way to get somebody to come home for you to do potty breaks specifically, maybe you should get an adult dog. I love adoptions of older dogs. Most of them are overlooked because the puppies are cuter. And a lot of times people don't even think about maybe an adult dog would be better for them. I'll talk about that a couple times throughout the series of sessions on choosing your canine friend. But just because you're really busy doesn't mean it necessarily rules it out, but you do have to be realistic about it. If you're gone all the time and you're out with your friends at night and gone every weekend, a dog's not going to be for you. But if you have the time to dedicate to that dog and you truly want a companion, think about an adult dog. Think about how much time you have for a puppy. Puppies take a ridiculous amount of attention. Everybody I've ever counseled on puppy training, and I wrote a book on puppy training, by the way. Puppy Care and Training is the name of the book. People have written me after reading the book. People have contacted me after we've had our puppy sessions for private lessons. And they're like, you know, when you said I had to supervise that puppy, I had no idea you meant every single second. People have an unrealistic expectation of how much supervision that puppy needs. So puppies require a ridiculous amount of your time. It is so worth it. It is worth it. But they really do require a lot, especially when they're babies. So Be prepared and make sure you have enough time for a dog. Another question to ask yourself, this isn't a fun one for any of us, can you afford a dog? Can you afford one? Dogs have costs. There's maintenance costs, you know, keeping them up, keeping them alive. Veterinary costs. There's a lot of costs, especially when they're puppies. They have to go quite frequently. Then there's wellness checks that they have to have. You have to give them their wellness checks. Heaven forbid if something goes wrong. I have had animals with special needs that costs quite a bit. It does add up. If they need special tests or special blood work or special medication, these costs can add up. And are you prepared to pay for that? There's also food. You want to make sure that you're giving them a quality food. And then there's supplies. There's crates and toys and tugs and leashes. All these things add up. The ASPCA has a great chart on their website, and that's ASPCA.org. On the average costs of pet care to give you a realistic perspective because if you're going to budget you want to know how much it is they average that annual costs and these are things food regular medical care toys and treats um, a license some areas of the country also require licensing health insurance which i do recommend for your pet i did not have it for many many years they didn't have it i don't think when i first had pets as an adult but i have it on my pets now And other, let's say, miscellaneous costs, the annual total can range from a small dog to about $580 to a large dog for $875. And those are annual costs alone. So you're looking at anywhere from $580 to almost a grand for just your annual costs. Then they add up other costs. For example, you're going to have a spay or neuter, other initial medical 
issues, the collar, a leash, a bag or a crate, training class. Training is required. You're hearing that from a professional trainer, but you do want to get your dog trained. And then it adds up to other costs there. So the total cost ends up from a small dog being about $1,314 to a large dog, about $1,843. Factor two, where you live. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day via Facebook and her dog needs an endoscopy. My dog just had an endoscopy and it was pricey because it's a specialist situation. He had to go to a veterinary internist to have this done. But where she lives in another part of the country, it was going to cost her twice as much to get the same procedure. So where do you live? Do you live in an area of the country where the cost of living is fairly low? Your veterinary prices are going to reflect that. Or do you live in a part of the country where everything is pretty high? Your veterinary costs are going to reflect that as well. They have to make a living and they have to survive in that same cost of living environment. So when you're looking at those average costs, you need to take your town into consideration. Nothing wrong with calling around. You want to make sure that you get a quality care wherever you go and interview those veterinarians as you would for a physician for yourself. But you're also going to think about your local stores, supporting local if you can, big box stores, online. There's different places you can get the average supplies that you can also save money on. Bottom line, pets cost money. So make sure that you can afford it because you don't want to end up with a puppy that needs medication and then you can't afford it. You want to make sure that you can support that friend that you're bringing home. When we come back, I'm going to give you even more questions to ask about whether or not a dog is right for you at this time and what kind of dog should you get in the first place. More coming up on Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, also known as the Pet Lady. I travel from coast to coast to pet trade shows and consumer events to scout out what the hottest, hippest, and most unique pet products are on the planet, bringing you tips and tricks from top veterinarians, groomers, trainers on how to safely travel and live happily with your pets. The Pet Lady will be in a city near you, showing off the latest and greatest tech pet gadgets, cozy comforts, and fab gift ideas for man's and woman's best friend. You can learn more at thepetlady.net or connect socially and tweet with me at Pet Lady World. This year, Americans are expected to spend a jaw-dropping $36 billion on their pets. From lighted leashes to high-end spa products, the discriminating pet owner can find just about anything to pamper his or her pet. Hi, this is Michelle Fern. Join me every week for Best Bets for Pets, where we'll talk about the latest pet products and talk to the companies that make them. Best Bets for Pets, every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Teodi Anderson. Today we're talking about planning for a pet, planning for a dog. We're asking those wonderful questions that you really need to look in the mirror, take a hard look and ask yourself, am I ready for a dog? And these questions are going to help you get there. So we've talked about, do you have time? Do we talked about, can you afford it? Here's another fun one. What is your lifestyle? Are you an active person? Are you busy? Do you run? Do you want a dog that's going to share those things with you? 
it also might affect the time you have. You know, for example, if you are out in a bowling league every night, probably can't bring the dog with you. Depends on the bowling alley. Dog may not want to be at a bowling alley. But if you are very active out in the community where a dog can't go, that's also going to impact the time you have to dedicate to a dog. But how busy and active are you? Do you like to go camping? Do you like to go hiking? Do you want a dog to share that activity with you? Or maybe you are a person who likes to sit and curl up on the weekends and watch movies and you want a dog that's going to snuggle with you on the couch. What kind of lifestyle do you lead? Because it's going to impact the kind of dog that will best fit your lifestyle. If you are a laid back person and you don't do a lot of hard physical activity, you may not want a dog that is busy, busy, busy all the time. It may drive you crazy. Also may not be good for the dog because if you don't give it that outlet, it's going to come up with ways to amuse itself, none of which you will ever agree with. Or maybe you want a dog that is going to be a running partner for you. You love to run and then you get a dog that's really not suited for running. So think about your lifestyle. Do you travel a lot? I have a client who chose a dog. She wanted her dog to go with her. She travels quite a bit for her work. And so she chose specifically chose a dog that would fit under the seat of the plane. Now, she put a lot of other thought into that, too. It wasn't just the size, but that was important to her. She wanted to travel with her dog on a plane, and she didn't want to put it in cargo. If you want that as well, you're going to have to look at some of the smaller dogs because they're very strict about what breeds now and what type of dog go under the seat of the plane. By breed, I'm talking about the dogs that have difficulty breathing. Some of the airlines have said that they won't ship them or they won't have them, uh, at least in cargo, during certain times of the year or at all. Because if it gets too hot, they already have difficulty breathing because of the shape of their face. So they don't want to incur that liability. If you travel quite a bit in the car, you want to be able to take your dog with you. You know, that might be another factor that you want to think about your lifestyle. Another question to ask yourself is, do you have or do you plan to have kids or are there kids in your life? For example, I had a client once who got a very, very large, exuberant Labradoodle, half Labrador, half Poodle. This was a very busy, bouncy, very large dog, probably topping out maybe 110 pounds, maybe at least 100 when he was full grown. But as an adolescent, he was still very large and very bouncy. And she did not have any children. All her children were grown. However, she was responsible. She chose to babysit her infant grandchild every day. So there was definitely an infant in that home every day. And there were problems with the dog because the dog would just run right over the kid, not mean to. Very sweet dog, but he had no clue how big he was. He was very out of control. That's why he needed me. And she was having issues because it wasn't safe for the infant. And then as the child got older, toddling around to have this huge lummox of a dog running around the house. So are there kids in your life that are going to be there regularly? Do you plan to have kids later? I've had clients call me. It is the saddest thing that they get a dog and it works great for their lives as a young couple without kids, but it's really not the best dog if kids are coming along. So try to think ahead. And sometimes you can't plan that kind of thing. I, I understand that too. But try to think ahead because there are some dogs that are really better with children than others. For example, toy breeds, the little ones, they're generally not great with small children or toddlers. A lot of uh, tiny dogs are afraid of little children. They're more at risk. Uh, toddlers like to grab things. It's very hard to reason with a toddler, if not impossible. They're like puppies too. So it can be really hard to combine the two. There are exceptions to every rule. There are some little dogs that love kids and are really good with them. But for the most part, as a generality, some breeders won't even sell you a toy breed dog if you have little ones, little tiny ones in your life, because it's just not all often a good mix. It can be an unsafe mix. And you don't want the dog to get aggressive and bite and snap either. Little human ones are very low to the ground and very easy to bite. So we want to make sure that we're making a good match if we have kids in our life. Another question to ask is, are you ready for a long-term commitment? I told you it was like matchmaking. Are you ready to commit because dogs are for life? We don't want to revolve them through the door like their appliances. They are for life. And are you ready for that? Because if you're not, you should probably wait. Wait until you are ready. And that's, that's a realistic thing to think about. What about your living space? 
do you have room for a dog? Now, don't confuse activity level and size. Here's a great example. People who adopt racing greyhounds, retired racing greyhounds, which I love, by the way, will tell you often that, yes, they need their exercise, but they are couch potatoes. Once they discover what the couch is, they love the couch. And they're really not as active as you would probably think. You think a racing dog, it's got to run constantly. No, not so much. They do need exercise, but for the most part, they love to snuggle and just just be couch potatoes. And they're a very large dog. They're skinny, very skinny, very sleek, but they're large dogs. So, It may work out if you have an apartment to get a retired racing greyhound simply because you're going to have to walk it. You're going to have to make sure it gets that exercise. But don't rule out large dogs in small spaces. Sometimes they work out great. By the opposite token, some people deliberately get little dogs thinking that they'll fit better in an apartment and they don't consider the activity level of those little dogs. Great example is the Jack Russell Terrier. We call them pocket rockets. (laughs) These dogs are packed full of energy. They go, 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 ready to go all day long. And so that dog actually needs a lot more exercise than another small breed might. So don't confuse size and activity level. Make sure you're considering both. But how much room do you have for a dog? Are you going to let it in the bedroom? Do you have a backyard? Do you have a fenced in backyard with a real fence, a secure fence? Or do you have access to a park? Do you have access outside? There are some folks that think that if you don't have a yard with a fence, you shouldn't get certain dogs. I think it's an individual case-by-case situation. Look at all the dogs that live in New York and Chicago and Miami. They live in high-rises. Those folks don't have fenced-in yards, and their dogs are fine. Um, Some dogs do well. Some dogs don't. I have a very dear friend who did not have access to a fenced-in backyard for many, many years. She lived in townhouses and she lived in apartments and she dutifully walked her dog every single day made sure that dog got the exercise it needed it was a large dog it was a collie and um, she did great they did absolutely fine so it depends on what you are willing to do to compensate for space if you don't have it and not all dogs need a lot of space it just depends but you need to think about that because especially if you want one of those giant breeds man they fill it up fast what about existing pets Do you have existing pets? And how do they feel about dogs? Had a client once who called me, a potential client, don't think I ended up working with them, because they had a dog that was nine years old that had a nine-year history of dog aggression. Loved people, hated other dogs all his life. I said, how long did this start? She says, oh, he's always been that way. And she wanted to get a new puppy. And she didn't like what I had to say. I was very nice about it, I promise. I just said, you know, your dog for nine years has told you he doesn't want any other dog in his life. And it is unrealistic to expect that he's going to embrace this new puppy just because you want one. And let's face it, what does this come down to? The person wants the dog, right? The person wants a new dog. Don't blame you. I have more than one too. But it's not going to work for the existing dog. What are your choices? Rehome the dog you've had for nine years and get the puppy or bring the puppy home and now have problems. It was a tough situation for her. But the realistic answer was, I mean, this dog was so aggressive to the point that he had put other dogs in the hospital. This was not a situation where he was slightly grumpy. This dog made it very clear that he hated other dogs and did not want to be near them. Didn't matter what kind of dog it was either. He would pick on big dogs, little dogs alike. It's just not a good situation. So if you have existing pets... How are they going to feel about the new family edition? There's always an adjustment period, but be realistic about how it's going to go over. What about goals? Do you have personal goals? For example, I love to do therapy work with my pets. I visit nursing homes and hospitals and local universities and schools with my registered therapy dog. So when I'm choosing a new dog, I look for specific things that might incline the dog to be a therapy dog. Whether or not the dog ever passes the test is irrelevant to me. It will be my friend for life. It will be my family member for life. However, I do have specific goals in mind. Nothing wrong with that. Do you want to do agility? Do you want to do other sports? You know, what do you want to do with this dog? What are your goals? I talked about runners. Do you want to run with your dog? You need to think about that when you pick out what you are going to bring home. What necessary canine requirements are you ready and willing to put up with because there are things about having a dog in your life that you have to do and with some breeds you're going to have to do it more than others for example 
you fall head over heels in love with the old English Mastiff. He's noble, he's strong, he's big, he's gorgeous, and he drools buckets. Absolute buckets. I had a friend once who was selling her house. She had an English Mastiff. He was a great dog. His name was Winston. And when they moved all the furniture out, she had to hire professional staff to come in and clean the walls because his drool had caked on the walls year after year after year. And she hadn't noticed because she just lived with it. Certain dogs drool a lot. Can you put up with drool? If you can't put up with drool, it's okay. Just admit that to yourself. Don't bring a dog home that drools and then get mad at the dog. Some people cannot handle hair. I've had people call me and say, I need a dog that won't shed because I cannot put up with dog hair. They should never visit me because every dog I've had has shed a lot. So my house does have dog hair and I invest in vacuums on a regular basis. But make sure that you can put up with a dog that sheds or doesn't shed depending on what you want. Grooming is a big deal. Some dogs require a tremendous amount of grooming. Poodles require grooming. Even if you're not going to do the fancy cuts, you still need to keep them groomed because that hair grows. Terriers, certain terriers need different types of grooming. You know, what are you willing to put up with? I talked about my friend with a collie. She loved to go camping and she had a rough collie. That's the fluffy one that looks like Lassie. And after the collie passed, she decided to go to a smooth collie. It's just more uh, wash and wear. And she loved the collie personality, but she chose the smooth coat because when they're out camping and running around in the woods and things, it's an easier coat to maintain. I have had short-coated dogs and I've had fluffy ones. I love them both. I will tell you the fluffy ones, they're really good to hug and they're really good to snuggle with, but they do require a lot more brushing. And Finian, the Papillon, has brought the most amazing things in from outside on his tail that you have seen. He brings in pine straw. He'll bring in leaves. One night, I thought it was a twig. I reached down to his tail to pick it off. It was a slug. Oh, my gosh. That was nasty. So know that about the dog that you're going to bring home. What about potty breaks? And this is a canine necessity. If you bring a puppy home up until about six months, it's going to need that midday potty break in order to eliminate. Guy called me once and he was going to get the puppy in the next week. So he wanted to sign him up for puppy class, which was great. I love proactive. Great. And I asked him, he was worried about house training the dog. And I said, well, I talked about crate training. I said, you have to give the dog a break during the day because he will not be able to hold it while you're at work. Well, he got mad. And he was saying, well, I can't come home during the day. I said, well, you need to. You need to hire somebody or, you know, get a neighborhood kid, somebody that you trust, hire a professional pet sitter to come during the day because the puppy cannot hold it. An eight-week-old puppy cannot hold his bladder and bowels all day. And he just got increasingly more and more upset. He says, well, I, I just can't do that. I run one of the top gyms in town. I am busy. I work, you know, nine, 10, 12 hour days. I said, well, you know, I need to tell you the truth. I'm not sure a puppy is for you because a puppy is not going to be able to hold it all day unless you're going to potty train it to go indoors, unless you're going to pee pad train it. And he was getting a lab puppy, so that's not something he wanted to do. That would be a lot of pee. So he didn't want to do that, but he was all upset. And I was giving him a realistic perspective of what he needed to understand. Don't know if he ever got the puppy or not. He probably did and then had a problem with house training, but uh, you can only do what you can do. So you've asked yourself all these wonderful planning questions, just like I asked you to, which I really appreciate, and you have all your answers. So now how do you decide? Well, you need to look at all your answers and then find the best type of dog that will fit with what you've narrowed down. There's lots of ways to do it. You can read books. You can go to websites. Certain clubs have meet the breed functions. It's usually once a year, sometimes twice, but they have a meet the breed event where you can go and meet a bunch of different breeds and pet them and ask them lots of questions. Of course, you have friends who have dogs that you want to talk to, neighbors. Talk to trainers. Definitely talk to trainers because trainers are going to tell you about behavior and what dogs they see the most of for certain issues, what they don't. They will be able to help you narrow this down. Some trainers even have a service that you can use to help you pick out a dog. Sometimes they charge for that. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they charge for that. And then you can deduct that from your first class. Everybody's different, but definitely talk to trainers. Talk to your veterinarian. Even if you don't have one yet, go find one, you know, interview your vet. You should have that lined up before you bring a dog home. 
and talk to your vet about different breeds and types of things because the veterinarian is going to be able to tell you about genetic issues and breed issues. For example, Labrador Retrievers. I've had two wonderful Labradors. They're very prone to hip dysplasia. That's when the hip and the socket don't match anymore. And it's arthritic and it's, it's very painful painful to the dog. There are lots of breeds that have genetic diseases that are very prevalent in that breed. Cancer, epilepsy, blindness, arthritic issues. So talk to your veterinarian. If you, if you have your heart set on these or you can't decide maybe on a couple breeds, say, you know, what do you think about this? And if the veterinarian starts cringing and rolling his eyes or rubbing his hands together in glee at the money he's going to get from you, which they don't do, I'm just teasing, but then you know that that could be a problem. But that's another good uh, resource for you. There are going to be some that try to sell you on a breed. They're going to make it sound like the dog walks on water, potty trains itself, can, you know, program your VCR for you, your DVR for you, and is just the most wonderful thing. Don't believe everything you read. Don't believe everything you see. Because there's going to be some downsides. As much as I love the dogs that I have and I love my friend's dogs, there are things that are going to drive you crazy. There are also going to be the opposite folks. And these are people who try to talk you out of them. Oh, you don't want that. This is all the terrible things that will happen if you bring this breed home. These folks crack me up and I actually like them better because I think that they give you a little bit more realistic perspective of what to expect. And also the reason why they do that is because they don't want the dog to end up in the wrong hands for someone who's going to change your mind, bring the dog and change your mind. So I know why they do it. The hearts are in the right place. So you don't necessarily have to take everything they say for granted either, but it's not a bad thing. If you go to one of those meet the breed events or you talk to somebody and they seem like they're talking you out of the breed, they're just being protective of that dog. They want to make sure that, that you understand what you're getting into. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Definitely what I want you to do is talk to rescue. Every breed has a rescue. And if you're considering a mixed breed, that's awesome. But think about what combination you might be interested in and talk to the individual rescues of that breed. The reason why is you're going to find out why people turn them in. Why do they end up in rescue? And you're going to hear the same things over and over again. For example, I once helped a friend find an Australian cattle dog. Great dog. Why are Australian cattle dogs turned into rescue? Well, they're really energetic dogs. They're really focused. They're really energetic. And they're a smaller dog than some of the, you know, they're medium-sized dogs. So people bring them home thinking they're going to be sedate. They're not. They're bred to herd cattle. So they're really, really active. And some people just can't keep up. They don't like a dog that's that active. Every breed's like that. The things that make it special about the breed are also the things that drive people nuts about the breed. And so they don't do their research. They bring the dog home. They can't take it. They put it in rescue, which can end up being better for the dog in the long run, of course. But rescue folks are really good to talk to because you're going to say, you know, what are the top five things people turn in this breed for? And that's going to give you a realistic perspective if that's something you can put up with. Don't completely fall in love with the dogs you see on TV as a resource because remember those dogs that appear in TV and movies are trained and there are lots of edits and cuts that uh, they have producers too, just like we do here on Pet Life Radio, producer who takes such good care of us. There are producers and editors that take care of the TV dogs too that cut out all the bad stuff for them peeing on set or doing something inappropriate and you only get to see the good parts on TV. So make sure that you understand exactly what you see when you fall in love with that cute little face in the movie theaters. And that's what happens every year, every time one of those big movies comes out. Remember when Beethoven came out? All these people bought St. Bernard's and then they realized they're huge and they ended up in rescue. Same thing happened with 101 Dalmatians. Usually happens when those big movies come out. So we're not going to do that either. Those are some sources that you can find for narrowing down what dog is going to best fit the answers to those questions. Take a look at the different types of dogs that are available. You know, hounds are going to hunt. They're going to always follow their nose. Herding breeds are going to chase. They're usually very smart, usually work well with people. They can be a little skittish depending on, on which ones of those, but they like to chase. That's what they do. Toy breeds, they're bred to be companion dogs. They're bred to be with their people. If you don't like a dog, as I said before, that follows you into the bathroom, don't get a toy breed. Um, working dogs need a job. 
they have to have a job. So you're going to have a dedicated worker on your hand if you bring home a working breed. There's also non-sporting as an American Kennel Club group. I think that's non-sporting is pretty much we're going to throw other dogs in here. So they're bred for a lot of different reasons. So you're going to have to research those dogs individually. And then, of course, there's rare breeds and miscellaneous. And then mutts, wonderful mutts. So we want to make sure that we are narrowing down the focus of what we think we can put up with, what we would love to have in our lives, because it truly, truly is a friend for life. So that's how we narrow it down. In my next radio show, we're going to talk about how to now find what you want from a reliable breeder. Yes, there are reliable breeders out there. I'm going to help you learn how to figure out who are the reliable ones from the bad ones. Give you the scoop on that during our next show. And then the show after that, we're going to talk about how to find the right dog for you from a reliable rescue group or rescue shelter organization. Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to thank my producer for helping put the show together. Also want to tell you, if you want to contact me about your questions or, oh, here's a good question for you. Have you ever gotten a dog and wished you'd asked yourself a question before you brought it home and regretted it later? I would love to hear those. I'll talk about those during the next show, too. So if you have one of those, definitely contact me. You can reach me at teoti at petliferadio.com. That's T-E-O-T-I at petliferadio.com. You can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Teoti Anderson. You can also visit the website at getpositiveresults.com. Please do pick up my book, Puppy Care and Training, if you're interested in getting a puppy, because we'll be talking about puppies and adult dogs from reliable breeders and rescue organizations in upcoming shows. Thank you again for joining me on Get Positive Results. This is T.O.D. Anderson for Pet Life Radio. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.